So for our next presenter, um, Don Weber is the information security consultant at Cutaway Security. Um, Don has a tremendous amount of experience in security management, physical and information technology, penetration testing, uh, performing web assessments, wireless assessments, a variety of architecture reviews, uh, incident response, and digital forensics. Um, product research, code review, kind of a long list of uh, tools in his toolbox. Um, things I would like to point out that are beyond kind of his bio specifically. He's uh, focusing on organizations in the industrial control system space. Um, some of the tools that have been referenced throughout the day today in regards to some PowerShell scripts and some other uh, capabilities Don as a contributor to the community. He is uh, really kind of a pioneer leading the way in industrial control system specific uh, um, system assessments. I've had the opportunity to work with Don on a couple of different engagements and he is a wonderful, wonderful human being and a great contributor to the industrial control system community. We're very, very happy to have him here and uh, I will stop taking any more time from you. Turn it over to you, Don. Thank you again. Awesome, excellent. So Tim, I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, the introduction. Absolutely, uh, um, I am all of those things and I actually hope more. Uh, Tim and the team here at the, um, as a part of the uh, um, SANS ICS, they're making me a better person, pointing me in the right direction and uh, um, keep me on the straight and narrow. So I really appreciate them and uh, all the assistance that they've given me uh, you know, over the past couple of years and even before that. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to be here. And like Tim says, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm drawn to this stuff because we're making a world a better, a better place. It, he's absolutely right when he says that. I know, uh, you know Mike uh, said that as well. And, and I see that in everything that we're, we're seeing here. I'm especially happy about the last presentation because we're seeing some of those baselines uh, that are coming out of actually implementing those things, those technologies correctly and having an incident response background, uh, extremely happy about that. But uh, I'm not here to talk about uh, that today. Today I'm here to talk about um, uh, doing a, a radio communications, uh, doing analysis on that, um, how uh, I do security research in this area. Uh, because I want to make sure people understand that just because you implement something uh, uh, via radio, that that transmission is public, that that information is out there, uh, it can be captured, it can be analyzed, and potentially it could be used against you. And so I want to demonstrate to help people understand uh, that um, those issues, uh, we need to put out research. So we need to do actually do the research, we actually need to document it, train people on it, uh, and talk about it. So that, that's my goal about this. Uh, and um, I actually did a longer talk on this. I've done an hour talk on this. This is the 30 minute version. So we'll have a fast version for this audience. Uh, and so uh, let's get into it. Uh, already described me. Uh, one thing that probably didn't mention, um, or at least that didn't uh, uh, come out in there, I want to emphasize is I am a uh, um, instructor, a SANS instructor for the ICS 410, uh, which is the ICS SCADA Security Essentials. Uh, this, you know, uh, uh, the people as part of that organization, part of that team, a lot of the knowledge, you're gonna see that it's gonna come out in this presentation. I'm gonna you know, quote Tim and uh, um, talk, uh, uh, use some of Justin's uh, input from the class. I also teach the assessing and exploiting control systems. But I say that because a lot of the knowledge comes from there, uh, a lot of the experience, but all of the equipment that you're gonna see, um, I'm, rep I'm kind of representing not only uh, myself and Cutaway Security, uh, but the ICS Village. Uh, all of the Phoenix Contact stuff, uh, equipment, PLCs, uh, um, radios that we're going to talk uh, use as an example today, um, it, that has been uh, uh, generously provided to me so that I can start integrating it, that into the ICS Village. And I want to make sure that uh, everybody realizes that that's a great project and they're, they're putting things out there. So, so why are we here? Well, as a part of a lot of our processes that are being implemented, some decisions are being made to make those endpoints uh, wireless. In other words, we, we can't lay wires down or um, uh, for some other reasons, we need to communicate with those endpoints uh, via some type of radio or wireless, okay? Uh, but when we implement those, we need, it, it's, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not magical, okay? It can be captured, it can be analyzed, and potentially can be used against us. And ultimately, the biggest risk is that if you understand the technology, how they're transmitting information, 
that you can transmit information to those endpoints that might have an impact on that, whether it's uh, um, the uh, endpoint that's sending information back to the master servers, you might send information as that endpoint, or you might send information to that endpoint. If it's an actuator, it will actually, you know, perform the actions if you send the information correctly. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to show, actually show you that. Okay. Now, I don't want anybody to think that these wireless solutions that are coming from our vendors aren't, don't provide the security uh, uh, technologies or uh, um, configuration capabilities, all right? They do, okay? Uh, as you can see here on the, the left-hand side of the slide, we can see that the Phoenix Contact radios, they do uh, leverage frequency hopping to be resistant to jamming, uh, also so that they can communicate uh, um, more effectively uh, in a closed-in environment. Uh, and it also provides the capability for doing encrypted transmissions, 128-bit uh, AES uh, encryption. Unfortunately, what happens is that the default configuration, like most of our uh, applications and most of our devices, that encryption is turned off. That is security is turned off. When you read through the documentation, the vendor tells you, hey, you need to implement, you should implement these security controls. Unfortunately, what happens is, is that these can be difficult to, uh, to configure and put into place. And what I'm, what I'm afraid of is that organizations are just going to, once they configure this correctly, they're going to say, hey, you know what, it, it's configured correctly, let's just deploy it like this. It's not that big of a risk, okay? Well, I want to kind of, I'm hoping to shift you away from that and get your team to implement the security, okay? Now, in the ICS 410 class, we teach these three eternal truths, okay? Denial of, ser ser excuse me, denial of service attacks are easy and to do and nearly impossible to defend. Uh, network capture, in other words, capturing those radio signals, you'll see in a second, um, that's always possible. Now, there's a distance thing, there's a power thing, but I can always capture, okay? It doesn't matter if it's frequency hopping, you know, it, it, it might make it a little bit more difficult, but you're gonna see in just a second, that didn't stop me for doing some of this research, okay? And then always, the attacker is gonna have some limited capabilities of transmitting. So if I can send a radio signal and I can configure it correctly, that radio is going to take it, it's gonna analyze it and potentially do something with it. And I'm gonna show you how we get there uh, during our research, okay? And what was really interesting is I gave a talk earlier about this, um, a, a radio talk at one of our conferences a, a couple months ago, and Tim asked me to include this last statement, and he was absolutely correct, and I'm, I'm just taking it as my own now, I'm giving him credit though, but uh, you know, he basically explained that statement right down there. It's like, if you're going to implement, if you're going to choose wireless technologies as a part of your process, you need to ensure that you can safely and reliably operate that process without that communications. So that definitely needs to be a consideration because we're increasing the attack surface, the publicly available attack surface uh, by implementing some of these devices. It can be, it can help us, but we have to make sure that we're doing it uh, in a manner that does not impact the operations of that process. Okay, so what do I do? When, whenever I'm doing an assessment, whenever I'm doing an analysis around this, okay, uh, doing my security research, if I'm going to be, cap be capturing radio signals, I need to know how to capture that uh, information. I need to have the proper equipment to do that. And then once I have that information, I need to have some software that can do some offline analysis. And that's what you see here. Uh, the software I'm using for offline analysis is gonna be used the Universal Radio Hacker. Uh, I got introduced to this actually teaching that assessing and exploiting class that I talked about earlier uh, because uh, I got out, I, I went to incident response for about three years and I can't, you know, so I got uh, a little bit less technical because I was uh, doing more management. But when I came back, uh, the tools for, for analyzing radio had changed. Universal Radio Hacker was in our course. I learned it and I just fell in love with it because of how easy it is to use and repeat uh, part of your processes. Okay. Uh, I've included some instructions on there on how I install it within the, um, my environment. So you can certainly uh, leverage that if you're if you're thinking about doing this later uh, yourself. From a hardware standpoint, I leverage that the HackRF one, and uh, um, Brent talked about it uh, when he was uh, giving his uh, talk. He mentioned how um, it distracted him a lot from his uh, studies uh, in law school. Absolutely, it distracts me a lot too. 
Uh, it's only about $300, a little bit more than $300, especially with the, a, a good antenna, uh, but it's open source. It's one of the cheapest, best radios that you can buy to do this analysis. If you're doing some uh, um, vendor analysis and you can get, there are better radios that you can get, but you're gonna see that I got nice clean signal captures using this open source solution. Okay. Excuse me. To do my analysis, I needed to locate and uh, record some transmissions. So I set up uh, the uh, Phoenix contact radios that you saw on the earlier slide. And I set that up in a manner that, you know, my ultimate goal is to set it up as a part of a process. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but right now I just set it up because I didn't understand the radios. I just set it up to do serial communications. In other words, I sent a transmission that I could easily identify. I configured to do the things that it would naturally do is actually it has the default. I use the default configurations, uh, which are frequency hopping. I identified a, uh, um, uh, a center frequency that I want to do my analysis on through research, okay? And that's where I came up with the 925 megahertz configuration that you see here, okay? Uh, and uh, I configured that specifically because I was going to have that center freak, and I know I don't believe you can see my mouse, but if you look in that uh, um, uh, the picture, the image on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that centered is a spike in that transmission, okay? I centered that up after some research, uh, but I really like this picture because it demonstrates the frequency hopping. In other words, the nothing's changing in this. This this uh, this, this window is uh, displaying two megahertz worth of bandwidth, and you can see that the um, transmitting radios hop different frequencies. And if you were actually seeing this live, you'd see a spike in the center, and then you'd speak, see a spike off to the left, spike off to the right, spike off to the right, uh, and so forth. Okay, and we use this to capture these signals. Now remember that frequency hopping because you're gonna see that in just a second. I use the, um, the URH to easily identify transmission, center on a frequency that I'm hoping to capture, and then write that to a file. From there, I use the tool's analysis capabilities, all right? And uh, in, in this case, uh, oh, it's a, a tab called interpretation, okay? I take a long capture, I, multiple transmissions, and you can see that in the top part of this uh, image on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see each one of those spikes is a different transmission, okay? It's a transmission within the two megahertz of bandwidth that I was listening on. So I'm gonna get, uh, uh, I'm gonna get uh, C transmissions to the left or the right. I'm also gonna see transmissions from other radios. I actually had to sift through a bunch of different radio transmissions to get the radios that I wanted. Okay, but that's a, just a part of the analysis. And what URH makes it easy to do is I can select a single transmission and that's what you see there in the top portion of that slide, that blue area. All I did was select one of those spikes and uh, right clicked on it and then uh, created a new single uh, signal out of that. And that's the lower part of the slide that you see. So I selected a single transmission and then I started to do analysis on that uh, single transmission itself. That lower part of the window, I start reconfiguring the settings that URH comes up with. Now, URH comes up with some default settings. It does some math and analysis on the back end, okay, and comes up with some things that it figures is correct to analyze that signal. And then through my experience and through education and training and so forth, I can just adjust those parameters to get the packet information, to tell the tool that reconfigure yourself to, th to do this, and then display the information that you think has been transmitted, okay? What's really interesting about that lower half, that lower picture, you can see the green and the red where they transition, okay? So that's your center line. That actually represents your center frequency. And as you can see here, my transmission that I'm analyzing here is slightly above that. Well, instead of, you know, the, the signal that I selected to analyze, at least this one, it was one of those frequency hopping so in other words, I didn't capture the signal on the, or the signal wasn't transmitted on the 925 megahertz center frequency that I was listening on. It was transmitted slightly off, but because I ca captured that information, it was close enough to my uh, center frequency. I captured it. Now I can still do analysis on that and pull that data out of there. So frequency hopping helps with 
uh, um, uh, communications between radios uh, so they don't step on each other, so that uh, um, uh, there's not as much interference. It helps with jamming, but it doesn't mean that we can't capture it and analyze it. Okay. Once I reconfigure all of those settings within the tools, it displays information to me that as a radio analyst, I understand and it makes sense to me. In other words, there's different portions of a radio signal that tell it like, hey, I'm transmitting a signal. Hey, this is meant for this type of radio and I'm gonna start the packet. Um, so the, that first one would be a preamble and you can see that I highlighted that information. I've pulled that signal that uh, um, analyze signal over into the analyst window. And now I can start labeling portions of that transmission to what I expect out of that, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, we have a, a, the, the yellow part is the preamble, okay? And so that's just the start of a transmission. All radios start that way. I mean, it, most radios start way. Let me uh, restate that. Most radios start that way, and then they're typically followed up with a synchronous synchronization word uh, and that's the green label right there so if you I'm not sure if you can see it, it we can see Bravo for to Bravo okay and so those two bytes um, are representative of like hey this is meant for this type of radio and the next uh, piece of the information is going to be a part of your packet okay uh, the red uh, highlight there is a length byte so how much data is in that packet and then I can start looking through that packet and identifying things. And you'll see in just a second, like device ID number, network ID number, and then all of the information that was transmitted after that, okay? And so this is just leveraging the tool to uh, uh, analyze the signal and identify things quickly, all right? Up until now, I've just been analyzing one single signal. Okay, and, and this is how you start. You identify these in a, in a single signal, but now that I have these configuration settings, I can analyze that full transmission capture that I get gathered, and then I can, uh, um, then the tool will automatically set things for me. Okay, and you'll see that in just, uh, and you can see that on this slide, okay? On this slide, we can see that uh, um, we've taken multiple transmissions and I've captured those and then I performed analysis. Now I did, uh, the tool automatically identified a lot of this information for me, okay? I did have to tweak a few things and, and make sure that uh, the configuration was correct for some of these packets, but it, that, it speeded up my analysis time a, a lot, okay? And then I can start identifying things that are associated with the actual transmission of data to management frames, so transmissions that are associated with the management of communications between the different radios. And then I can start analyzing what was inside those packets. Uh, you might not see it. So if you look at the upper uh, um, image, uh, there the information is in there, but I've taken that and I've switched the mode, the view that's being displayed to the user. I've uh, in the bottom image, I've switched that view to uh, be ASCII view. And as you can see, I did transmit uh, over this radio I transmitted it because it was sending serial communications. I just transmitted the string cutaway smash, which was 12 bytes. And you can see that represented up in the, um, in the upper window if you uh, uh, did the um, calculations yourself and, and converted those uh, um, each one of those bytes to that, it would come out to be the same, okay? So cutaway smash is what I transmitted. I transmitted that in clear text the first time, first a bunch of times. After I got a good capture and I knew how to uh, um, detect these packets, I changed the configuration of my radios and I encrypted that. I told it to encrypt the packets and I just retransmitted the same thing. And that's what you see in the upper two packets that I have uh, identified. Encrypted data, 24 bytes, and I do put a question mark and you'll see, you'll see why in a second. But I've confirmed that at least the information that was transmitted once I enabled the encryption was obfuscated in some manner. Hopefully through encryption, but I need to continue my analysis to understand whether or not I did that or whether or not they've done that, excuse me, okay? And then uh, we can see here that uh, um, some of the other discerning features associated with those packets on the left-hand side, we can see the device ID um, is uh, for the different devices. I've identified transmissions coming from a sender device as uh, ID three management uh, device or manager device, excuse me, is uh, device ID one. So I know which direction the transmissions are going. 
I know they're on, on the same network. This 7F right here is a network ID. If you look, if you go back to uh, my beginning slides where it said the default configurations, uh, the default network ID is 128, which in hex is 7F. So I leveraged these things to understand whether or not I was capturing transmissions from the radios that I, that I wanted. I can also use these things to identify different portions of uh, um, a control network if that were the case. Now, I, I put a question mark in the encryption part. And that's because uh, my understanding of encryption, uh, I understand certain things that, uh, um, uh, that can be used to analyze encryption uh, and, and what's important, okay? And uh, a part of, uh, I, I know that these radios, and, and we pointed it out earlier, these radios are supposed to be doing 128-bit AES encryption, okay? With a little bit more analysis of the actual devices themselves, I went out to the FCC uh, um, site, pulled down information about the radios and how they're configured. I understand the radios that are in there. I understand the microcontrollers that are inside. I could actually pull them apart and, and identify those radios and microcontrollers as well. But when I did my research on that, I determined that the radio itself doesn't do encryption. The microcontroller within the device doesn't do an encryption. So therefore the application has to be doing the encryption. In other words, there's some other part of the process within that radio um, that's encrypting that information, okay? And so what I did is uh, I, I started looking at that implementation of it, okay? Uh, cutaway smash was 12 bytes, but the encrypted data was 24 bytes. And so I'm not really sure how much, you know, what they're doing on that information. If you understand encryption, you realize that that is, um, uh, it, it's not expected and it needs to be investigated. Also some concerning things about, you know, from me, because we're not doing radio, because they're not leveraging the microcontroller or the radio to do the encryption, more specifically the radio, those management packets are not encrypted um, and uh, the full packet isn't encrypted. So I can do things like identify uh, the radios and, and so forth. So if I were gonna continue my analysis, if I'm gonna, cause I'm obviously gonna continue my research on this, uh, some of the next steps that I would be considering, especially if I'm concerned about these things for an actual implementation within a process, I'd uh, definitely be diving uh, more deeply into that encryption analysis to understand how the vendor's doing it. Um, but I really, my ultimate goal is to determine whether or not I can retransmit packets and the radios will accept them. So once I have a config, once I have enough understanding of how they transmit information, accept information, hopefully I can reconfigure some of my radios, use some different radios, some hardware based, based radios and potentially send transmissions uh, which could result in a denial of service attack um, and, or to actually start, and my ultimate goal is to reconfigure this whole thing, not to send serial data that can be read like cutaway smash, but actually send Modbus data so that I can have control of uh, the endpoint devices. Now, we've done, I, you know, I did all of this analysis. It's very, very technical. Can you take this home and implement it? Sure, absolutely you could. But if you are deploying these technologies within your, uh, um, within your organization, I'm gonna give you a better method of doing that because that takes, everything I've just described takes a lot of uh, configuration, a lot of lab setup, a lot of retransmission. It takes a lot of time in other words, and time is money, okay? But if you're trying to determine whether or not your solution has been protected, I'm gonna give you a non-technical radio assessment, uh, radio security assessment methodology. Okay, so number one, obtain your configuration files. Number two, search for some word that you understand is associated with uh, um, the security within that configuration file. In this case, the Phoenix contact encryption is that word, all right? Uh, you're gonna wanna note the results after that. You're gonna do something else and then you're going to profit within your organization, right? Okay, so we had nine, so we had, uh, um, uh, I was using the Phoenix contacts RAD 900s, okay? I was on Windows and, and most of you are gonna be on Windows when you're gonna do this. And so I'm using, I'm gonna search, I'm gonna use PowerShell and use the uh, PowerShell functionality to search. So I'm gonna use the select string with the pattern uh, um, and look for encryption within my configuration files. And you'll see in the image, okay, that the configuration files 
where there's no encryption, that uh, the setting is actually false. When it is encrypted, the setting is true. And also those configuration files contain the encryption key. So you want to protect these files just like you would protect the files that are associated with the other devices within your process. And then finally, that question mark, which is usually the unknown step, what do we do to profit? Well, in this case, if you're doing a security assessment, that's report. If you're doing this within an environment, if you're part of a, a team within, a, um, uh, within an organization securing these devices, you wanna document this information and then figure out how, which direction you're gonna go forward with it. So just to you know, wrap all of this up, to have a conclusion, all right? You need to understand the most important things, just exactly what Tim said at the very beginning of this, um, or at least that I pointed out that he said, um, which is that you need to ensure that your process can operate without those radios, okay? If people wanna do damage or if they, people want to um, uh, prevent you from communicating over this, it's absolutely possible, okay? So your, your processes need to be resilient just like you would, they need to be resilient for any communication medium, okay? Uh, default settings typically for these are not encrypted, okay? And that means that they can be intercepted and analyzed. And as you can see, even if it is encrypted, I st can still capture it and gain a lot of information through my analysis, okay? Which is gonna help me with other tools and uh, um, other capabilities down the road, all right? Uh, and so you need to test and verify your implementations. That's a part of what I'm doing here, okay? The reason why I do this is we can search uh, the project files all day long, but some people need to validate that these protections are in place, that there's not increased risk, that we're not increasing our ta attack surface um, or un, uh, um, increasing it so much that it's unacceptable, okay? And so that's why I provide this research, that's why I do this um, uh, type of uh, analysis, okay? And so I'm hoping that you know all of you can understand how important this radio stuff is, doing research, supporting tools around this, um, and actually, uh, you know, supporting your teams in doing some of this, whether it's just grepping all of your configuration files and identifying how to secure those devices or actually proving that the, uh, um, your, you've reduced your attack surface, that the vendors are implementing things correctly and reducing your attack surface as well. Okay. So once again, special thanks uh, um, to all of the SANS ICS team. You know, they, they mentor me with all of these things and, you know, kind of keep me in the direction of what's important within these environments. And I really appreciate that. And once again, none of this would have been, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without the ICS Village helping me, supporting me with uh, um, equipment um, and encouraging me to do the research as well. So for those of you that want to continue on this, and Brett, this is your slide. Okay, uh, you can look at this, uh, um, uh, you can go out to this link right here. Uh, I have actually done two things. So on my site, and uh, um, you can look on the slides um, uh, uh, on the Cutaway Security Resources uh, page, and uh, you can do two things. You can download, and this is a link to the iMovie where I go through the analysis, all the analysis that you see there. I've created an iMovie to show you how to use the URH tool. There's also uh, up on that site, in the resources uh, section in the slide uh, where the slide decks are uh, you can click click on that and you can actually down the, download the demo file that contains all the captures and do the analysis yourself with urh you don't need a radio you just need the software you need to install urh run the software and uh, um, uh, and point it at the project file and you'll be able to do all of the analysis i did for this project or for this presentation so finally, you know, my name is Don Weber. Uh, Thomas Van Norman is a part of the uh, ICS Village. You can contact him if you're interested in, in that as well. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, um, present. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim, for inviting me, sir. <laughs>